Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Hope you're all well. So the title of my uh, talk is, uh, well, I, I think an email it got changed a little bit, and then the second part definitely got cut off. Uh, Mom, Dad, do we believe in human evolution? S uh, colon, moving beyond, shut up, beta, and please let me drive. Um, <laughs> this, this quote I got from a real life uh, question and answer session. So um, start off with just a quote from Ibn Rushd Averroes, an Islamic philosopher of the 12th century, the truth does not contradict truth. Um, and then similarly, Galileo said, two truths cannot contradict one another. We'll see the relevance of these quotes shortly. So why did I pick this topic? It seems uh, sort of random, but it's not. One of the things that animates me, one of the reasons why I'm so uh, you know, passionate about this topic is because of some concerning statistics. So uh, according to Pew, one in four American Muslims is currently leaving the religion of Islam. Uh, that's pretty concerning, and those numbers are probably going to go up with time. Now, there are many reasons why people leave religion. I don't think they are usually primarily intellectual reasons. However, after interviewing you know, some ex-Muslims, it is revealed that there are some intellectual reasons that can uh, serve as obstacles for people, um, especially the younger people, which causes them to leave the religion. So these are the three major issues that come up. They're the staple issues, and they're the issues that I focus on. So the first is Islam and violence. That's why my dissertation is on the topic that it is. Islam and women, not surprising. And then finally, Islam and science. So this is a big one as well. When it comes to science, one of the major stumbling blocks is evolution. And that's not surprising given that atheists have tried to weaponize uh, evolution um, and say that it is a distinctly atheistic uh, doctrine. So this is uh, Jerry Coyne who said, and he's a founder of Why Evolution is True. He's speaking at the Freedom from Religion Foundation's annual convention, and he said, the fact of evolution is not only inherently atheistic, it is inherently anti-theistic. It goes against the notion that there is a God. Richard Dawkins, famous uh, new atheist, he uh, gets a lot of mileage out of, uh, out of uh, evolution, um, and it kind of uh, informs his worldview. Now, there is a relationship between rejection of uh, evolution or aspects of evolution and religious identity or religious, religious belonging. So the, da the data backs that up. Now, I'm showing a lot of uh, data and text on the slide. You don't need to pay attention to all of that. Um, there's also a correlation between education level and views towards evolution. So as you uh, advance in your education, we see that the percentage of people who fully accept evolution goes up. So those with postgraduate degrees, for example, it, it becomes three quarters who accept uh, evolution with no exceptions. There's also a correlation with age. And this is why I br decided to bring this topic up today. Because as the, we look at the uh, age ranges, we see that the younger you are, the more likely you are to take it for granted that evolution is true. And I repeat that, take it for granted. Okay. So this is why I think many of us will face this issue when we're when our children are advancing through their education, um, they're going to start asking us these tough questions. And that's where I got the uh, title of this uh, presentation from, was the fact of, uh, you know, I overheard this conversation where a daughter was asking, uh, mom, do we believe in it? And, and mom didn't really know, to be honest. And so she said, just let me drive, please. So is this only a Christian issue? That's something that you often hear, that it's only uh, Christians who've had an issue with reconciling religion and science. So here is uh, the famous Galileo uh, issue. Well, no, if we look uh, at polling data, um, there is definitely some issue with regard to that when it comes to Muslims and acceptance of evolution. Um, when it comes to human evolution, this is particularly controversial. And so here are a list of uh, Muslim personalities who reject human evolution. Now, they're not all the same. And one thing that I wanted to stress today is actually that we don't all need to agree on one specific view. And more importantly, when you talk to your children, I think it's important that you are aware of the different viewpoints on it so that you at least give your, your kid some leeway. If you try to dictate one viewpoint on them, it may be that that doesn't really work for them specifically based on their circumstance, their upbringing, what they're learning in school. So it's probably a good idea to give them a range of options that they can choose from, even if you yourself pick a different opinion, you could say, look, this is where I lean towards. This is why I think so. I'd really like if you, you know, <laughs> you know, we all like that our kids have our viewpoints, but also give them leeway because what you don't want to do is put them in a, uh, in a bind. 
And that's really what the atheists want, the new atheists. They want you to put you in a, between a rock and a hard place. Now, there was a Muslim imam uh, who once uh, did publicly endorse um, human evolution. Uh, and he said in an op-ed that, unfortunately, there is a children's madrasa-level understanding that goes on amongst Muslims, and it's really time for Muslim, Muslims to move on as adults and intellectuals. Now, Dr. Osama Hassan actually became a very controversial figure, and, uh, and quite unfortunately, he got involved with the wrong political folks and kind of uh, discredited himself. But aside from that, part of the thing that might have pushed him in that direction is that he was immediately subjected to death threats um, and cancellation from the Muslim community. So he was hounded out of the mosque where he was an imam. He wasn't allowed uh, to give talks there anymore. Um, and this was you know, over a decade ago. So we're hoping that things have progressed since then. But one of the reasons why I chose today to speak to the adults as opposed to the youth is A, my kid is really young right now, so I don't know how I'm going to talk to my kid about this issue. Um, I do think it's a sensitive topic and that we need to be tactful. Um, but I think that it's important first for the adults to have adult-like thinking before we talk to, to our children. Because right now what we have is people who grew up with the very one form of religiosity growing up, uh, which is kind of childlike as uh, Osama Hassan said, and then you have these children who are growing up, they're you know, studying sciences and humanities and all this stuff. So they're really adult-like children. So that creates this kind of discordance. Um, what happens often amongst people, Muslims, is what's called cognitive dissonance. That is, you hold two opinions that are in conflict with each other, but you don't really realize that they are in conflict. And I think that's the case with, when it comes to evolution, where many people want to affirm evolution and do affirm it, but then at the same time, you know, we accept the Quran, we believe it's the word of God. Well, how do we reconcile that? Oftentimes you don't actually realize that those two things might be in conflict. And that's, uh, that gets challenged when your kid asks you while you're driving, hey, do we believe in it? And how do we believe in it? And then finally, there is the idea of not wanting to talk about controversial issues, just staying away from them. But that, this is what's causing uh, the problem of you know, our young Muslims leaving the religion, it's because we're too scared to talk about these topics and we're too scared to even think about these topics. So at minimum, what I want us to do is at least start thinking about these topics in an intelligent fashion. So who do you ask about this question? Well, there are uh, Islamic clerics, mullahs or mulvis, um, or they're scientists. I actually don't think either of them are necessarily equipped to deal with this topic. Um, they both have their roles in specific areas. Uh, but for example, scientists, even if you're a Muslim, physician or scientist, um, do you really th stop and think about the philosophy of science and study that? Really, I don't think so. Um, so we really need to think hard about who we listen to. It takes a lot of uh, study of philosophy to really tackle this topic. Okay, so with all that preamble out of the way, the question is, mom, dad, do we believe in human evolution? Uh, and now a little bit about this talk. I put this quote up by Avicenna Ibn Sina. Um, because there is a little bit of trepidation when I give this kind of talk, because I definitely don't want to have happen what happened to Osama Hassan. Um, but I believe that withholding truths from an intelligent person is inappropriate. That's what Ibn Sina said. And I look out around the room and I see a lot of intelligent people here. So the question is, how literally do we read scripture? And when I say literally, I actually, this is probably the wrong word. How literalistically do we read scripture? Because I actually do believe it's important to read scripture literally to see what it's actually saying. But there's a difference between reading it literally and literalistically. Sometimes the text itself is meant to be read in what's called a majazi or a metaphorical way. So the question that we have to ask, well, how do we read the specific proof text in question? But before we do that, I think it's important that we look at other topics related uh, before we go and jump straight into those specific texts. So now I'm going to put up a few Quranic passages and ask us all to think about how do we interpret these? Do we interpret these literally, literalistically, metaphorically, or figuratively? So here's a description of paradise. The description, uh, so this is verse 4715. The description of the paradise promised to the righteous is that in it are rivers of fresh water, rivers of milk that never change in taste, rivers of wine delicious to drink, and rivers of pure honey. There they will have all kinds of fruit and forgiveness from their Lord. Gardens with rivers flowing beneath. 
Indeed, the righteous shall have salvation, gardens, vineyards, and full-bosomed maidens of like age, and full cups of wine. So how literally are we taking these? Well, first of all, let's try to think about what are the different things that are promised to us in paradise. Gardens, rivers, water, honey, wine, fruits, vineyards. There's also the controversial issue of maidens. Um, and there's another, uh, but we'll skip that for now. So is there any unifying theme here that we notice? Th these kind of descriptions, what do they really appeal to? Well, one of the obvious things is it seems that it might appeal to somebody living in the 7th century desert Arabia. If the Quran was revealed to, let's say, in Norway, do we think that the same exact description would be used? How do we think it might be uh, described, paradise? Probably beaches, the sun, sand. So that's interesting. So the question is, was paradise just like designed for people living in the desert? Or are these kind of descriptions meant for a specific purpose as opposed to just describing literally what paradise will be like? Uh, there's an interesting thing. Uh, if you look at South Asian literature from India, uh, they have depictions of paradise that are like p pictures and stuff that are very different than this kind of description. And these are Muslims who are, who are making these. Um, they're like castles, gold, platinum, that kind of thing, because that's what we like, South Asians, right? We like gold, platinum. Uh, but that's how we imagine paradise. So that's interesting that we kind of think of paradise as what would appeal to us. What's also interesting is actually the, the translation that I gave you. Is another way you could translate it is the parable of the garden that has been promised to the pious or the reverend. The, the actual Arabic word is mafal. Um, and if you look at the Arabic dictionary, it includes parable. It means parable. And even in the Quran, verily God is not ashamed to set forth a parable of a gnat or something smaller. As for those who believe, they know it is their truth from their Lord. So we know that the Quran, we may be open to the idea that the Quran is using something in a metaphorical or figurative way. Now we're not all going to agree on that. This was a big debate in Islamic history. How literally do we take the descriptions of paradise? There was a group of people who said that, no, we need to take this very literalistically. The Quran says it and therefore we believe in it very literally. So there was a group like that. Then there was another group who took it metaphorically, who says that, well, there is something in the next life that uses that same kind of name, but it's, of, it's totally different. So that's another very common way. And then finally, there's like a figurative uh, interpretation, which is that this is all designed to entice people and designed to, like the, uh, even the uh, descriptions of hellfire are designed to strike fear in your heart by just bringing to mind those things that A, would most entice you and most cause fear in you but that in reality, the uh, paradise and the hereafter is nothing like you've seen here. So it's indescribable. Similarly, we have God's attributes mentioned in the Quran. There are verses that talk about the face of God, the eye of God, the hand of God or the hands of God, and even the shin. And the shin is uh, thought to be the, the shin of God. So the question is, how literally do we take these? This again was a big debate in Islamic history. There was a contingent that wanted to take these very literalistically. But then they would say, then even that contingent was broken down into two groups. One group said that we affirm what the Quran says, that he, God has a face, God has a hand, God has um, all these things, but we don't know how. We deny the howness, we don't know how. Uh, Bila kaif is what it's called. Whereas a second group would actually affirm that no, we can say a little bit more about it because we take the meaning of it. And meaning is invested in words, otherwise they're meaningless. So there was this contingent of people who took it literalistically. Um, but for the most part, the majority of Muslim scholars did not. The majority groups uh, understood that this is metaphorical language, that God is not like anything, is not like a human being, and that therefore we do need to take a majazi or metaphorical interpretation of these words. So for example, God's hand refers to God's bounty, um, his grace. Um, similarly, the shin that's being laid bare, that's God's greatness, grandeur, so everyone will bow down. Um, so these are, and then there was another third group who actually went even further and said that this is meant to be taken figuratively. Figuratively is a little bit different than metaphorically. We can get into that later. But, um, but these people who take a more uh, metaphorical or uh, uh, figurative interpretation, they point to the Quran itself, that the Quran says there is nothing like unto him. And so they point out that God is completely unknowable. He's ineffable in that sense. And because we can't speak of God with anything of human language, 
the best we can do is use metaphor or analogy to grasp at even the bare minimum that we can. Similarly, there is a hadith in which the Prophet says that uh, what is your promised in paradise, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, etc. Which again points to the same idea that because no one has seen it, that it's of a human, uh, that is a human, therefore the best you can do is use metaphor, symbols, allegory. If we, so that's, now with all that preamble out of the way, what I want to say is that if we want to portray a more sophisticated Islam to our children, then it is imperative that we learn our own tradition. And so when I say tradition, I mean the exhaustive tradition, as Muhammad Arkun says. The exhaustive tradition is more than just what a specific sect or group would want to show of our tradition in some idealized fashion. Instead, we have this vast array of sources within our tradition that we should be made aware of, but unfortunately, we're not. And so that's what I'm calling to mind here. So there were many different groups in Islamic history. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the different groups, except to say that there were those who took stuff literalistically, those who took stuff metaphorically, and those who took stuff figuratively. So these are the different uh, groups. There's not going to be any test, and it's too much uh, information for this talk. Um, I put it in just in, quest in case there's question and an answer. But basically, they had different viewpoints when it came to the balance between reason and revelation. So the first group, which was the more literalistic group, believed that reason was almost something bad, that revelation is what's important, and human reason is actually more like whims and desires and causes you to go astray. To be very honest, this is what many of us grew up on, this view being um, presented. It's perfectly fine if you want to hold that view, but what I would say is that this is not the majority view historically. There are certain reasons why this has become more dominant in the last few decades, certain political reasons. Um, even what, what can now be considered mainstream orthodoxy, such as taught at Al-Azhar University, they would be what's called semi-rationalist, uh, where they, they still thought revelation was superior, but the difference was a lot closer. They did see an importance for human reason. Why? Because God is the one who gave us human reason, and that's the only way that you can come to scripture is by your human reason. Then there were what can be called the Islamic rationalists. They actually believed that there's no conflict between reason and revelation. Oh, well, I, both of these groups believe there's no conflict, but they also believe that because reason was God-given, that they go hand in hand. So reason is, uh, perfected reason is equal to revelation. Um, and then finally, there were the Islamic philosophers who actually prioritized reason above revelation, even though they still believed in revolution, re revelation, um, they believed uh, that ultimately God is the one who gives us reason. The source of reason and revelation are the same, which is the, div the divine mind. Now, you don't have to agree with all of these or any of these. Well, some of them, you have to decide which, where you're going to fall. But it's important for you to have this in mind so that when your kid asks you those difficult questions, you have these resources to draw upon. Because what you don't want them to do is say, I reject your specific form of understanding, dad or mom, and that's why I'm leaving the faith. And when I speak, so I'm actually debating, um, not a debate, it's going to be a dialogue. Uh, I'm debating an ex-Muslim, perhaps the most famous ex-Muslim from Pakistan. Where I'm, I'm doing that later this month. Um, and I'm reading his book right now in order to prepare for that. And what I noticed is that the uh, the understanding of Islam that he has, the Islam that he rejects in his book, I would reject as well, and I do reject. So uh, he doesn't, he's not aware of this vast tradition. He's not aware of our dynamic and sophisticated thinkers of the past, those who inspired even Enlightenment thinkers later. Um, not that that is how we define our worth, but um, this is why it's my mission, that I've made it my mission to tell the Muslim public that we have this vast tradition. Um, so, but broadly speaking, we could say there has been this ongoing battle in the Islamic history between what can be called traditionalism and rationalism. But these are not two discrete things, one on the other side. Rather, there's a spectrum. So the question is, how do you balance these two things? Because both are important, tradition and rationality. So again, going back to the two topics that we talked about, when it comes to paradise, um, there was the literalistic, the metaphorical, and the figurative or allegorical. When it came to the literalistic uh, understanding, this can get very literalistic. So even descriptions of paradise, such as the scale, the pond, the bridge. Question is, how literally are we going to take this? 
And I'm betting that the younger generation are going to have a harder and harder time to take this explicitly literal. Same thing with uh, God's attributes. So there's the literalistic, the metaphorical, and the figurative approaches. I would also like to introduce this idea of different classes of interpreters. So Ibn Rushd, um, a famous Islamic philosopher, said that, look, if you, and, and you don't have to read the whole uh, slide, I apologize for that, just putting the quote there. But he basically said that if you meet somebody who believes in the literal understanding of scripture, and they have no doubt in their heart about it and no problems, then he actually believed it was forbidden for you to then tell that person otherwise. Why? Because then you would introduce doubts, shubuhat, in his heart or her heart. And so, look, if your kid is com perfectly content, you're perfectly content, uh, not thinking about this more, and you just take the literal and you grew up with that, perfectly fine. But what happens when uh, you have somebody who does have a problem with these interpretations, who does see that there is some sort of conflict, and as we saw, there is a correlation with education level and um, how you take um, evolution, et cetera. So in that, um, for that purpose, I would say that you should consider these other options that are less than or more than the literalistic approach. All right, I'm going to skip through some of these. There are also two different attitudes to outside knowledge uh, between those who took a more metaphorical or figurative approach, the philosophical approach. They believe that the truth is the truth no matter what its source might be. Ibn Rushd said, for example, famously in the first quote, truth does not oppose truth regardless of whether this other one shares our religion or not. For Ibn Rushd, for example, now he wasn't around after Darwinian evolution, the fact that Darwinian evolution was founded by, a non, uh, you know, this theory was put forward by a non-Muslim wouldn't be of relevance. The question is whether or not it's true or not. And he actually believed that Muslims should eagerly seek out these other books, but they should only accept what is correct in them, while if there is anything incorrect in it, we should draw our attention to that and actually forgive them for the mistakes that they make. So this is a very embracive, uh, embracing kind of perspective. On the other hand, you had people who were uh, less embracing. So for example, Ibn Taymiyyah, he, and he is the one who is the inspiration for many of the, you know, the Salafi or Wahhabi movement, um, who's against this sort of thing. Um, Basically, anything that was foreign was by default un-Islamic. So these are two kind of modes of thought. All right, so let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, so <clears throat> now we're going to get closer now to the verses that are uh, in regard that might cause a conflict with human evolution. We're not going to talk about all the issues that might cut up, come up with evolution. There are certain philosophical issues that would also come up. But we're just going to talk about the scriptural aspect because that is actually the major stumbling block for most Muslims. So uh, what many Muslims today don't know is that historically, the Islamic scholars had profound tools and hermeneutical strategies to understand scripture uh, that went beyond just the purely literalistic. So for example, Imam Ghazali, who is considered very mainstream, orthodox Muslim, uh, he actually came up uh, in, a, in his Kanun uh, al-Tawil with a way to interpret scripture. First of all, he said reason is important because it's only through reason that you know the truth of revelation. Otherwise, it's circular logic. And he acknowledged that texts are not only to be read literalistically. There are actually five levels of meaning. You don't need to know all the five levels here, but basically they're, every level is more abstract than the other until the final top level is just uh, f completely figurative. So Ghazali said that you're only really denying scripture if you deny that it's true on any of these five levels. All right. So if you believe in scripture, but you say it's abstract, it's more figurative, that's not necessarily denying the truth of scripture. However, Ghazali did say that in order to move from one level, from the literal to the more abstract and moving up that chain, you did have to have a proof for moving up. And what was the proof? So according to Ghazali, if reason and philosophy and what today we would call science conflicts with a revelatory source, that is revelation, the Quran, if it conflicts and we know that the philosophy or the science is true, then we must take an abstract interpretation of scripture. Because otherwise, we would be, forced, we would be putting scripture at loggerheads with science. And that would be foolhardy to do. And that would cause people to disbelieve in religion. 
Now, he did, again, say that you need a rational proof. And it says move down a level, but really should be moved up a level, like in an abstract way. This rule was formalized by Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, who was, again, one of the biggest Islamic scholars in our history. And they called it the universal principle. That whenever we uh, go to the text, this is how we interpret it. If something conflicts with our human reason, if there's proof beyond a shadow of a doubt, then we interpret the scripture in this metaphorical way. All right. So this is a lot of technical stuff. But basically he says, then, and he's saying then, if the proof is uh, you know, established, then we consider allegorical interpretation to be permissible. And this is the universal principle. This was the dominant school of thought in Islamic history. Unfortunately, because of, again, certain politics, petrol dollars, it's another form of Islamic thought that has now dominated uh, the globe. Ibn Rush, the Islamic philosopher, actually went beyond Ghazali. He actually said, because truth cannot contradict truth, he acknowledged that there were these five levels of meaning that Ghazali affirmed. But he said that you can move to a more abstract level. You don't have, actually have to have a proof to move up a level. Instead, you just move up a level of abstraction if that reading becomes more convincing. So you had the Ibn Taymiyyah model, which is the more literalistic model. This is the one that is now being propagated to our youth. And if you go to our Islamic websites, this is the view that's being put forward. Ibn Taymiyyah was a hardliner. He was a brilliant thinker, no doubt, but he was a hardliner. And what he said was, he first stated that religion and science, really there was nothing as called science back then, but philosophy, but we'll use science for today. He said, reason and science cannot conflict. And he just stated that dogmatically. So that when there seemed to be a conflict between the two, he said, well, revelation is 100% certain. And so reason is not 100% certain. So he would always prefer revelation in its literal meaning over what reason said. This is the view that is being used today to deny human evolution or aspects of evolution. Um, and so this is something that we should think about. Now, you may agree with this. Again, I said we're not all going to agree on uh, a viewpoint today. But at least you should be aware of these three different viewpoints. Because when your child asks you that question, do you want to put them in this tough situation where he or she has to accept fully either one or the other? All right. Um, now, the question is, with this kind of abstract uh, thinking, there is the fear of going too far. We should recognize and appreciate the fear felt by some Muslims that we won't run the risk of interpreting away all of scripture and all of religion. I think the question, however, is where do we draw the line? Because you cannot read even God's descriptions in the Quran completely literalistically, even if you take a Salafi or Wahhabi approach. For example, the Quran says God is in the sky, fis sama, but they don't read it as God is in the heavens or in the sky. God is above the heavens for them. So even that, uh, their opponents would say, look, you're not taking that literalistically. Um, and I would point to what Ibn Rushd says. What's important is that you affirm these things. For example, we affirm the reality of the next life. And we can disagree about the howness of those things. But what's important is the principle itself. So what R Ibn Rushd says as well, which is helpful, is the truth of the matter is that the obligation incumbent on each person is to take the position to which his speculation leads him to, provided that such speculation does not completely destroy the original principle, namely the denial of the existence of life after death altogether. And this is in his uh, famous treatise, Faith and Reason. And what he's saying is applicable here to human evolution as well, which is why I bring it up. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead because I think we're running out of time. So I will get to... Um, so... <clears throat> Muhammad Asad is an important thinker that we'll get to. Um, here I want to just uh, quickly look at this question of were there Islamic scholars uh, of the past who uh, endorsed human evolution? I would say here that this case is often overstated by people who are anxious to prove evolution in Islamic history. However, there were certain scholars who did take a non-literal interpretation of the Quranic verses of creation when it comes to uh, the creation of human beings. Um, there's a famous book by uh, Ibn Tufail, the 12th century Islamic philosopher, Hay Ibn Yaksan, which talks about a character named Hay who is raised in this remote island without any people. So he's a feral child. 
And the question is, how did he get on this island? Well, Ibn Tufail gives two possibilities. One is spontaneous generation, that he appeared there without a father or a mother. Or two, that he was cast into the sea from a neighboring land when he was an infant. Now, when I first read this story, I thought, ah, okay. So he's trying to say that you could either take it, number one, like uh, creation uh, ex nihilo, that is, God just created Adam, um, or you could take a more historical explanation. Actually, it's the other way around, because back then they used to believe in Aristotelian spontaneous generation. But the point is that he still acknowledged that you could take this either which way. Um, the point at the end would still be the same. And we'll get into why that is. Um, so let me just, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to. So at the end of the book, so, th so there's this feral child. He's on this island. He's raised by himself. The debate is about how he got there. So he, the author gives two different explanations. And then at the end of the story, uh, the main character, Hay, gets, reaches the highest pinnacle of religious belief, which is mystical union with God, in his opinion. And the author could have just ended the story there. But instead of ending the story there, he actually introduces another character who comes from another island whose name is Absal. Absal is fleeing a land because he's being persecuted for his beliefs. So he meets Hay, they get to talking, and he finds out that the people of his island, of, the, of his land, take their beliefs very literalistically. And Absal is now a philosopher. He can't really take it in that strictly literalistic way. So you have to flee that land. Well, eventually they go back to that land. Um, and there's a third character that they introduce, Solomon, who takes a very literalistic view of uh, the, the religious texts. So at first, these two philosophers try to tell the people of that land, no, no, you've misunderstood it. It's not to be taken literally. But when they start doing that, they realize that people are either rejecting the religion entirely or they're ready to go and kill those two philosophers. So they immediately realize that this is a fool, uh, foolish way of proceeding and that those people need that kind of literal approach to entice them to uh, good action. So what they realized from this experience was that religion can be interpreted in different ways by different classes of people. And so the two sail off into the distance. That's the end of the story. This story was translated, uh, this novel, and read uh, by many Enlightenment thinkers. So uh, that's something of interest. And there were other Islamic philosophers who, uh, or Islamic thinkers, who talked about things that seem very similar to human evolution. Ibn Khaldun is often uh, talked about in this respect. It's questionable whether it's really evolution there. It's really what he's talking about, something called the great chain of being. But the point is that they were taking a non-literal interpretation of scripture. Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead just to now to the Quranic verses. So we're getting to the meat and potatoes of it. So when it comes to the Quranic uh, story of creation, we do have to ask ourselves, are we taking this as literalistic history, as a symbolic narrative with moral, religious, and spiritual implications, or as both literal history and symbolic narrative? I leave this open up to you. We're not all going to agree with this. We're all, some may have passionate viewpoints um, and want to strike down the other person. But I say leave these possibilities in your, in your head. And if you're talking to your child and they can't accept one or the other, give them these options. So the Quranic creation account is actually uh, very similar to the biblical accounts. So in the biblical account, we know that there were seven days of creation. So this is from Genesis. The Quran affirms six days of creation. Indeed, your Lord is God who created the heavens, the earth in six days and then established himself above the throne. What's different here is that the key part is that God did not rest on that seventh day. Instead, he established himself above the throne, establishing his power. So this verse is, tr is intended to show the power of God, that nothing can exhaust his power. Now, of course, there is another verse in the Quran that says these tw hours are, uh, 24 hours are not like your, these days are not like your 24-hour days. Um, so you could kind of take this still literally if you, if you want to. But then you read in the hadith, there are um, uh, hadiths that talk about creation in more depth. And here we have a clear hadith uh, in Sahih Muslim, which talks about the same six, seven days that we think about in the week, Monday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And this has actually just happened this week that someone came up with this on WhatsApp and actually said, I don't know what to do. Ex-Muslims and atheists are asking, how can the plants or trees survive without sunlight? Because the plants and the trees 
were created on Monday, but light was on Wednesday. So this is why I'm saying don't be hasty and jump on someone who's saying what I'm saying. There might be some wisdom in what we're doing here. When it comes to the creation of human beings, there is the idea in the Bible about God as a potter who's uh, creating the first man. So this is in Genesis. Uh, in Isaiah 64, 8, we read human beings are saying, we are the clay and you, God, are potter and all of us are the work of your hands. So there's this uh, Christian website, God formed man out of the dust from the ground like a potter. The Quran has echoes of this in it. He it is who created you from clay, then decreed a term. A term is appointed with him, yet still you are in doubt. We indeed created man from dried clay. We, he created man from dried clay like earthen vessels. There's also the idea that God created human beings by his own hands. God said, O Iblis, what has prevented you from prostrating unto that which I created you, uh, unto, unto that which I created with my own two hands? Now, we are, I grew up taking this very literally, but then we do know that we don't take, most of us, don't take God's hands here literally. We say that that's God's power. So we're already applying some level of metaphorical abstraction when we're reading this text. So it's not that big of a stretch to say that this could possibly be something more than just a literalistic account. There are also hadiths, and this is again, this was just very recently that this hadith came up. Oh, not this one, the next one. But this one is talking about that same kind of idea that's in the Bible. And we have to ask ourselves, is this really meant to be taken literally or more figuratively? But this is the one I was talking about. This one comes up quite frequently. And your kids will face these things. Because now with the internet, there are tons of anti-Muslim websites that are pumping out this material. So you can't avoid this topic. This is a difficult topic, but you can't avoid it. So here is the idea. It's in Sahih Bukhari that Allah created Adam, making him 90 feet tall. And people have been decreasing in stature since Adam's creation. And there are echoes of the Bible here where there was the idea that there used to be giants that roamed the earth and that heights have been decreasing since then. Now, there are different ways and strategies that Muslim thinkers have used in order to explain this. But I would suggest that understanding that there are other possibilities as opposed to just literalistic understandings is one route that we should embrace. The Quranic story of uh, Ad Adamic creation is actually grouped with some other stories. For example, the story of the people of the cave, the story of the man with two gardens set forth for them the parable, the mathal, of two men. How literally do we take that? Historically, there were Islamic scholars who actually asked, who were these two men? What were their names? It reminds me of a joke that was in a movie. There was a guy who was trying to say a joke, and he said, there are two guys, they walked in a bar. And then the other guy said, what were their names? Where were they from? What were their jobs? Is that the point of the... Uh, so I wonder if this is... You know, if we get into those details, are we really missing the point of the story? And then the story of Iblis refusing to bow to Adam is mentioned with the word parable, mathal, in it. And these last two, especially the story of Dhul Karnain, this issue, there's a website by an ex-Muslim, this issue is what caused him to, major issue that made him leave the faith. And if you just Google Dhul Karnain and zombies, you'll see that this caused a big controversy. Um, so these are issues that are out there, that are real, that we need to deal with. All right. So here I'm just pointing out that Ghazali himself has taken this to be non-literal about God's hands in relation to Adam. So we take a metaphorical interpretation. All right. Finally, I would say that these creation stories are very, very important. They are dealing with previous accounts. So before the biblical account, we can look at the Near Eastern accounts, the uh, Babylonian, Mesopotamian accounts of creation. Like, for example, the Enuma Elish. This was a creation account that said that human beings were created from a fallen god, an evil god. And from his body, part of his body, human beings were created. So they had this guilt on them to begin with. And they were meant to serve the gods. And... Um, this account really had a negative view of human beings. What the Bible did, and we believe, again, the Bible is one of, you know, regardless of what you think, at least at some level we respect the Bible. Um, 
what the Bible does in the Genesis account is affirm that there is only one God, not like the chaos of multiple gods fighting in those uh, Near Eastern stories, but there's only one God and, gr- and God creates man in his own image and therefore human beings are of, noble, uh, of nobility and of importance. So it thereby inverts the story in the sense that human beings have a divine, noble, and honored origin. The heavens and the earth, meanwhile, are created to serve and sustain human beings. From God we come, and to Him we return. And finally, the uh, biblical account can be used to understand a certain level of human equality, that we all come from the same source and we're all noble and, uh, uh, in that sense. The Quran, meanwhile, mirrors the Genesis account with notable differences. The Quran denies that God rested and instead establishes himself on the throne. That is, God is full of power. The Quran displays a more optimistic attitude towards humanity's fall. Whereas the biblical account curses the earth for Adam's transgression, the Quran declares the earth as a dwelling place for human beings for a time. God forgives Adam. Adam is not destined to die for his sin, and the doctrine of original sin is therefore rejected, thereby also establishing individual moral responsibility before God. All of this is intended to call people to belief in God and the hereafter, that is, to moral accountability and to goodly behavior. In other words, the Quranic creation story is doing some heavy theological work. So I suggest that we look at this as what I call theologizing narrative. Whether or not you take it literally, you could still take it literally. If you think that you need to take it literally, no problem. But you should understand that it's still what we call theologizing narrative. The purpose of this story is to do theology to get you to think of your place in the heavens and the cosmos. Where do we human beings fall? And from that standpoint, it's superior to Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution says that we are the result of just chaos and accidents, and we're just a blip on the evolutionary time scale, and that we are going to be destroyed, and that's it, meaningless. And there's a great Dawkins quote on that. The Quranic and biblical accounts alike place humankinds at the center of the story, and therefore uh, they ennoble humankind. So creation stories matter. Whether we take the Quranic creation story as historical or symbolic, its moral and ethical implications are profound. And then you can compare it to certain creation stories, for example, in Hinduism. Not all of them are the same, so I'm not trying to smear Hinduism or anything, but there is this myth of that uh, human beings were created from the different body parts of, uh, of this uh, 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 divine figure, and that the servants, the, or the shudras, were from the feet. So you can see how the Quranic story is doing a lot of heavy theological work by positing that we come from the same original source, and that God's soul is breathed into, that God breathes into man, so we're noble and equal in that sense. And like I said, Darwinian evolution has the same problem, and that's why Darwinian evolution did lead to what's called social Darwinism in the 19th and 20th century that led to imperialism, racial superiority, and also even Nazism. Because if you think it's just survival of the fittest, what will make you think that, okay, then white people in Europe are the most fittest and everyone else is is not fit and should be eliminated by the forces of survival of the fittest. I also think that there's an issue of scientism where we try to import science into scripture and then we can kind of twist both of them. And as Ibn Rush said, then we cause people to disbelieve in science or we cause them to disbelieve in religion. I'm going to close with just examples of Muslim thinkers who did embrace this more allegorical approach. One of them is one that we, many of us read this translation. It's by Muhammad Asad. He actually has in, in his appendix, appendices several uh, uh, pages dedicated to this idea of symbolism and allegory in the Quran. And this is one of the reasons why his translation is sometimes considered controversial, but I think it's a worthwhile read for you to consider. Uh, And so basically here, he's just simply saying that these are things that we're describing that no eye has seen, um, and therefore you need to use allegory and symbolism. This is uh, Asad on God's attributes, just like what I've been saying. And this is uh, Asad on the hereafter, just like I've been saying. So he again stresses that you use metaphors, allegories, and parables. The first, uh, one of the first people to really talk about this in depth was Muhammad Iqbal uh, in in the uh, mid 20th century uh, uh, figure, early 20th century century figure. Um, Not a lot of South Asians here, but if you're South Asian, you would know Muhammad Iqbal is a is a big figure. But he even talks about the creation account of Adam. 
Now there is another side of the equation, and I'm going to point you to some resources to some Muslims who are pushing back against uh, this idea. So there's this uh, Sabur Ahmad. Uh, you can take a look at that. I do have my own critique of that, which is I think they take a very anti-realist view towards science, and meanwhile they take a very naive view towards interpretation. What do I mean by that? When you read scripture, as the fourth caliph Ali said, you're just that's your interpretation of the scripture. There's a difference between your interpretation and what the scripture is saying. All right. Uh, and I'm just closing off with the quote of Ibn Rushd that at the end of the day, you take the position which your own speculation leads you to um, and don't force other people uh, to go in the direction that you have gone. Um, everyone will reach their own destination when it comes to this. As long as you don't uh, destroy the original principle, which is belief in God in the last day the hereafter, et cetera. And that is the end of my talk. I'm open to questions. Um, and then we have a mic. So if you don't mind uh, speaking the mic, because we want to catch okay. it. Um, just out of, how, can you hear me? It's going to the camera, so you don't worry about that. OK. Uh, <laughs> I was just wondering what the Torah's viewpoints are. Because um, I know you were comparing the Quran and the Bible, and I was just interested, because that is also a, Abrahamic faith with similarities. So yeah, the, um, the Torah affirms the, like for example, the creation accounts. So it's a similar issue for uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So and so if you look at some of the debates and discussions, we're just kind of beginning these in our community, but they've been having them for, for a while now. And what, how do they perceive evolution? There's no one, and that's kind of my uh, key point here, is that there's no one unified view. So some insist on the literalistic view. Um, however, what I would say is that most Jews and Christians in, a, in the West have moved away from the literalistic, other than what are called fundamentalists. So in some sense, our community is still at the fundamentalist stage, technically. Um, that's kind of a ju you know, judgmental term, but uh, that's the reality. And what are you planning to tell your son? <laughs> I don't know. Like He's too young. That so that's comes. why I don't know. Because that's what, I'm wondering yeah. <laughs> like what to tell my kids. Um, this, is a big, this is a big issue. Uh, first, I think you have to figure out what you yourself believe, what you yourself incline to. Um, and for that, a little bit of reading, a little bit of watching is important. This is just kind of tip of the iceberg that I gave you, although I gave it through a fire hose, I know. Um, but. Uh, once you figure that out, then you can begin to think about how to talk to your, ch your children. I do have an inkling of how I'm going to do it. Um, I think the way it, the Islamic philosophers like Ibn Rushd uh, had it in their minds, I think that's a useful way. What they believed is that when your kids are younger, then you do tell them the, the literalistic interpretation. It's only at a later age when they start questioning and asking that then you, you have to kind of gauge it and then slowly reveal. So you don't give stuff all at once to somebody. So that's how I think I'm going to do it. Right. And um, this is just for my information. So evolution also includes like the dinosaurs and stuff. Yes. And obviously they existed because we have proof. But are, they're not mentioned in the Quran, right? Like, no. So is that just an oversight or what, what? So I think if you take the literalistic approach, then you can start asking these kind of questions. But the way I view it is that the Quran is, in, is not intended as a science book. It's not intended as a history book. It's intended for guidance, moral and spiritual guidance. And from that standpoint, I actually think it's superior to science books. Um, and I think this trying to jam science into the Quran is demeaning to the Quran. You're going away from the very message of the Quran. Um, so that's why I, I think that's what's called scientism, which I'm against. Um, okay. Yeah. And there, there was this kind of trend of trying to insert like, scientific miracles and saying they're in the Quran and trying to put everything in the Quran. I think that's not understanding what the Quran is meant for. So it's fair to say that the Quran is just like a snapshot of a moment in time, like a guidebook to how I to think live. the Quran is interested in what can advance its moral, spiritual, and religious agenda to get us in the right relationship with God so that we also act correctly and rightly. So that's how I view it. So it, I don't think dinosaurs, for example, help in that aspect at all, so the Quran would not mention it. Even the Quran's mention of past prophets and stories is very, very selective. It only talks about things not in order to inform you from like a purely educational perspective or a history perspective, 
but ra or even entertainment purpose. It's meant for moral and spiritual admonition. So that's how I take it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, nobody's face will be coming on the video, by the way. It's just your audio. Okay, I, I thought I was uh, listening to what you were saying, but I still don't, did not get quite. If you, like Darwin's theory of evolution, what are your views and how is that aligned with the Quran or how is that opposed to the views of the Quran? I didn't hear you say something clear. So now you're asking for my specific views. Yes. Okay. So my specific views are that uh, the theory of, ev of Darwinian evolution, and I'm not talking about Darwin specifically, but as it's developed, um, for me that has l reached a level of certainty such that to deny it would put our, um, and say that our religion is opposed to it, would, cause, would put us in a state of peril or jeopardy, our faith. And therefore, I take the approach of uh, and, uh, you know, those tools that Ghazali, Razi, and Ibn Rushd gave us, which is when something reaches a level of certainty, when it comes from a scientific or philosophical perspective, then we take uh, a more allegorical understanding of scripture. So that's the view that I take. But again, it's controversial, and not everybody is going to accept that. I appreciate you being straightforward. I'm a scientist, and I basically disagree with the uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. So, thank you. Understood. Thank you so much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for um, diving into um, an area which I think many of us think about a lot, but are um, unclear about how to proceed. And you've given us, I think, at least some, a bit of a way to, to do that, which is great. Um, uh, I have to say, uh, I guess for the record, that I'm a scientist. And I do believe in Darwinian evolution. And I do um, appreciate the, uh, uh, the approach that Ghazali is doing, which is this sort of um, uh, moving myself when I read the Quran uh, from one phase to the other but never disrespecting it or losing my awe of the Quran or the religion and I think probably each one of us does this as we read it from being a child to being an adult it, it's not just for science it's about the the morals of the or, or the or the way society was at that time uh, whether it be the treatment of women um, or the treatment of slaves. So, so I think I think that's a natural progression, and I think, uh, of course, one always runs the risk of you know rejecting the religion based on that. But I I I have found myself personally not able to reject the religion. Actually, I'm in more in awe of the religion. So that's that's my interpretation. I want to say uh, one thing, and that is you gave a, a fairly long list of. Uh, personalities, I think you call them personalities, <laughs> of, 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 of people that are against evolution uh, or uh, had that type of a literal interpretation. But you didn't give too many names, except for I think one person who was disgraced, of, of people who uh, are able to hold the idea of, of human evolution uh, with the Quran. Why is there no list at all of, of folks? I didn't see a, a counter list. And finally, are you going to make this available for us to look at? Because you went through a lot of slides very quickly. Uh, thank you so much. The three excellent questions there. So the first point I really appreciated that you said, and I would actually stress, because that helps me with the last answer that I gave, is that even though I believe in Darwinian evolution, I actually believe that's, and that's why I'm also from a scientific background. I'm a practicing physician still. Um, I believe that even though something can, is true, it can be so mundane as to be not of much significance. So for, ex for me, like I said in the presentation, Darwinian evolution, even if it's true, um, is not something that gives me awe or wonder in that sense, whereas the religious uh, story and the religious content does give me awe. Because uh, the Darwinian, if, if, if you take a purely Darwinian approach uh, and take that as your religious view, as Dar Dawkins does, then I don't think there's any reason to think of humans as noble uh, uh, creatures 
for which the entire heavens and the earth were created. So I think religion and revelation are superior to science. Um, so I don't mean to demean uh, the, the religion or um, revelation from that standpoint. And I feel that many of the interpretations and reinterpretations of scripture that go on in order to defend the uh, Quran in a very literalistic fashion, I find those to be demeaning to the scripture itself because I think then you're engaging in textual acrobatics and trying to jam in science in there. And then demeaning the content where it's talking about stuff that's up here and now you're talking about down here, in my opinion. Because up here is the spiritual, the abstract, and down here is just the mundane. Though. So that's how I see it. Um, your second question was about the list of thinkers. You're absolutely right. The list is almost non-existent. There are lists of, uh, there, there are some Muslims who are academics who have accepted um, I this whole thing and reconciled it. But as far as people who have a sway in the public space, they have not. I suspect partly because of the fear and trepidation involved with saying it. And so that's something that I had to overcome today to um, kind of uh, give this talk. And there, who knows? Maybe I'll be canceled. I don't know. They're, they're, we don't know. But uh, I believe that it was important to have this difficult discussion. And finally, thirdly, um, the video itself will go up. Uh, I think I'm a little bit possessive about my PowerPoints. But, uh, and, I, and they're very long because I kind of retool them, and it's for my own thought process. But it will go up, and you'll be able to see a lot of the slides there. Can we do two, 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 like both at the same time, and then I'll answer sure. after? Yeah. Oh, uh, wait, sorry, with the mic, please. Uh, my, my question about this uh, evolution here is, uh, is it a scientific fact or a scientific theory? Because uh, I remember years ago, uh, we had this argument with my wife about uh, evolution, and I told her, yes, I absolutely believe in it. And she was like, what? And I meant, it, I meant it, and I meant it as I believe in it as a theory, but not as a fact. There's a lot of scientific theories out there. And uh, the, we need to differentiate between fact and theory. And my question is, is it, this was years ago, has it become a scientific fact, or is it still a scientific theory? Because we call, I believe that we can all accept theories as theories, but not as facts, until they become facts. So Thank is you. it a theory or a fact? OK, great. Thank you. And then I'll take the second question at the same time. Thank you. Well, um, well, my feeling is that the Quran is easy to understand. And I think if someone feels their faith, I don't think they're going to leave their religion because they can't understand this story in the Quran. I mean, uh, uh, and I feel that if, about evolution, if, uh, it, I mean, that we, we don't understand God's plan. So whatever God's plan is, this is the way it is. If, I mean, there are so many things we do not understand that I don't think it can uh, cause us to leave our faith. But uh, I did have one question. Uh, let's see. Oh, you were talking about Omar Hassan. And why was he criticized or uh, threatened it when he spoke about women's rights? What did he say about that? OK, thank you so much. So I'll answer both questions. So as far as whether evolution is a theory or a fact, um, this is, uh, there's a difference the way these words are used by the general public and how they're used by philosophers of science. There's a difference how they're used by scientists. Um, so the reality is, is that what happens is that we see that it's called a theory, and then we say, oh, so it's not a fact. But this is kind of mixing up those different lingos. So as far as I know, you know I've studied a bit of uh, philosophy of science. Everything is a theory. And uh, so that doesn't mean whether it's true or not true. Uh, but this is a huge, I mean, you could study for like months and months on philosophy of science. But what I would stress is that I believe that the burden of evidence and proof, it's, it's very, very high. And the only standouts, and this tells you something, really the only standouts are people with religious beliefs. And so that should tell us something. And I also believe that part of Islam is that we defer to the specialists when it comes to issues. And I think here that that is what we should do. But again, that's my viewpoint, and it's up, open to debate. Um, and, and, and as we see, we, there are some scientists who disagree. The only thing I would point out is that most of them come from a religious background. Um, the second point, uh, the second question, um, well, first, 
I would say that one of the reactions that I commonly get when I give talks, uh, because I love talking about the controversial topics, the hot controversial topics, is why does this matter? I mean, this doesn't matter. Um, I think it does matter because of the statistic that I showed at the beginning. Uh, one in four are leaving, and this is one of the most commonly cited reasons. And I think it's presumptuous to say that because it's not a problem for me, that it might not be a problem for someone else. Um, perhaps I put that in a very presumptuous manner. I didn't mean to be disrespectful. Uh, it's just you might be very strong in your faith, but there might be someone who reads it and it hits them in a different way. And so I do think it's important that we think about these things and that we have answers. And we've already thought about it before our kid asks us those questions. Um, so that, that, that's what I would say. And then the, I forget what the last part of that was about. Uh, Oh, so uh, he, so he, Osama Hassan fell into controversy after he said the evolution, and that really put him in the crosshairs. But then after that, he made some unfortunate uh, moves. Of um, there's this Quilliam Foundation that had ties with the far right wing, um, you know, monitoring surveillance, su surveilling Muslims, Muslim communities. That's very, very problematic. That I definitely disagree with. Um, so unfortunately, when you do things like that, you disgrace yourself in front of the community. So one of the things that I do, um, is the reason why it's harder to uh, discount me from that, is I'm very anti-imperialistic in my viewpoints. So when it comes to US foreign policy, et cetera, I'm very clear where I stand. And I think the community wants to hear that you stand with them, um, as opposed to aiming your guns at them. Um, that's how I take it. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I'll be uh, roaming around. I think we go, yeah. I, but I'll still, do you want one more, or all done? I mean, right. here's the, oh, comments, you go comments. Can we do it with the mic? If you have time after the prayer, you can. Uh, sure, I'll be here. Music. Yes, thank you. Yeah, mine's just a comment. Um, so coming from a South Asian background, my husband actually does believe in evolution. And so that's, I mean, the rest of the family, his parents, my parents are like dead against the idea because they can't fathom it. And um, I think they take a lot of it for things that's written and the Quran is very literal. So this was very, very Thank you. I appreciate that. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Great.